Um, we're back again, and uh, we're continuing our conversation about, <clears throat> I lost the agenda again, but I know what the bill is, is S-140. And our final witness on S-140 is here. This is the time of year when witnesses get stuck in other committees. And so we thank you for coming this morning. Ivana Davis, our director of well, she'll give us her title. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Sorry for being late and for struggling to get off of mute. Well, that's actually part of the what happens when we get close to crossover. I think so. No problem. Please go ahead. Thank you. So um, I am here just to give some brief remarks in support of um, S140, I believe we're talking about, which is yeah. related to court services and protection from civil arrests um, in, in state buildings and at court locations. Very generally um, and very simply, because I think you've probably heard from others who have detailed their support in with, with greater uh, accuracy. I think that I would just like to share that this is a really important bill for Vermont. We are a state that of course is a border state. And because of that, we've experienced our fair share of more than our fair share of tension with the federal government and with others who have um, perhaps varied views on immigration in the United States and what implications it should have in people's day-to-day -day lives. We as a state, I and many others um, respect and honor and rely on and appreciate the community of immigrants and refugees and undocumented persons and anyone else who is new to the state or new to the country and the reliance in particular of our agricultural sector on this group means that we have a responsibility not just to benefit from the labor and the presence of folks who are in the state, but also to recognize that as members of our community and as participants in our economy, we've got to have a focus to make sure that they are well protected as long as they're on our turf. So I am strongly in support mm -hmm. of this bill, which would provide protections and of course, and a, excuse me, a right of action um, for those who are arrest, against being arrested um, for things like immigration. And I'm, I'm saying that because that's one of the biggest ways in which we see this happening is ICE arrests. In my last few years in New York, before I came to Vermont, um, I think the situation had gotten really untenable. There were all kinds of nefarious ways that agents were looking to befriend people inside and outside of courthouses just so that they could either secure recorded offhand non-Mirandized confessions or just get them alone in a room so that they could then proceed to arrest and remove them. Um, if enforcement of federal immigration laws or any other civil um, laws is going to take that level of, well, I'll say it, underhandedness, um, then I think that that's a time when we really need to step back and ask ourselves, what is our purpose as a state? What is our goal as a state? And what role do we want to play in helping that, in fueling that system? I think that this bill is an appropriate stopgap so that we can not only protect ourselves, but also protect people. If we expect them to show up for court for other matters, then it shouldn't be creating a chilling effect uh, under threat of potentially being taken away for something else. So. I'll stop talking here. Um, again, I think that you've probably heard it more eloquently said from others, but I just wanted to um, appear with you in person and make sure that I express my, my strong support for the bill. Uh, I think we've lost Senator Sears. Um, so I imagine he just lost his feed for a second. So Senator White. Thank you. Susanna, did you? Um, you are an attorney, and this is this is um, enforceable. You found that out in New York that this law is enforceable. Yeah, correct. We actually, um, I was surprised to see uh, that it actually appears to be going quite smoothly. And 
the right of action actually is an important piece here um, because it's, first of all, signals that we're serious about it, that we wanna protect people so much so that we wanna make sure that they have recourse in case this is violated. And that matters because for example, when we introduced, I don't know, driver privilege cards, we had a policy that said, we're not gonna take these lists and give them to ICE. And then the mm -hmm. lists were taken and given to ICE. And so by adding, by attaching an enforceability clause here, what we're doing is saying, we're, we're serious about saying we want to protect people from these negative outcomes, from these consequences. And we're gonna do that by utilize, leveraging our own um, organ of the state to ensure that people do have that recourse. And I think that that matters because it demonstrates a genuine commitment to wanting to see this outcome. It makes it so that it's not performative and it makes it so that it actually has teeth. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed part of your testimony. The, my feed went down. My internet is unstable again today. Um, Aren't we all at some point or another? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm afraid so. So I missed part of your testimony and the question from Senator White. I don't know if there are other questions. I deeply apologize for missing part of your testimony, but I, I think I got the flavor of it that it is a problem that this bill will partially address. Um, I can just imagine if somebody's a victim of domestic violence, for example, tries to go to the county courthouse to get relief and gets arrested by ICE or some other uh, group uh, that that's what strikes me um, particularly difficult where somebody's trying to get redressed for a violence against them or some other um, matter. Correct. And I think that when you start to think about um, mixed status households, um, then things get even more complicated because at that point now our futures and outcomes are bound up with those of the people around us. And so it creates a chilling effect, certainly for the individual, but also for people around them because of the domino effect of consequences that we could have on households, on families, on workplaces, et cetera. Thank you. Senator White has another question. I, I do, thank you. Um, we had a discussion earlier this morning, because Susanna, about um, the, the way it's written, if, it, um, if I remember it correctly, the discussion was that if, the, the person is there because they are involved in some court, they're, they're there on business, but the family member isn't there on business. Uh, are we also protecting the family member here from arrest, the brother or the daughter or whoever? I think that there was some discussion about the way it was worded and what we were doing. So I just wanna make clear that we are also protecting the family member that comes for support or the ride or whatever. I'm, I'm probably gonna defer um, to other witnesses who are gonna be coming at it from that deeper um, legal perspective, particularly those in AGO, DGO and or the court system, only because I think that they'll be able to provide you a much better insight into how that's gonna be, that language is gonna be interpreted in Vermont courts and in proceedings here. Um, but I will say that to the extent that you're willing, if the language does not clearly, does not clearly state that family members are also protected, I would encourage the committee to consider that as well. Because of course we know that, um, you know, when we think about chilling effect, that doesn't just extend only to the individual in question, it extends to anybody who depends on that person. So, um, you know, I'm thinking about households here who are mixed status, perhaps you have a child who was born in the United States and parents who were not, and the things that individuals in that family feel safe doing or not doing, um, which is certainly an implication that extends to people in, in a person's orbit. Thank you. Thank you very much for hanging in with us and, and thank you for being here. Thank you all very much. Um, are there any other questions? If not, why don't um, we're going to go to a different bill, um, S228, that deals with no knock warrants. And um, 
to introduce that bill, we have Senator Ron Hinsdale um, from Chittenden County, uh, who is the uh, lead sponsor of the bill. So welcome, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, committee. Um, nothing but is Just great. before we start, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I've got an unstable internet. If I get bounced off again, um, please don't take offense. And Senator Bruth, please take over the meeting. I'll try to get back in as soon as I can. Go ahead, please. Sounds good. Um, or not good, but understandable. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's life in Zoom world. Right. Um, so... So the uh, no-knock warrant ban is fairly straightforward. Um, six states have restricted no-knock warrant bans, and this would fall into that same category. Um, some states have more exemptions from the ban uh, than others. This particular bill includes one exemption. So just to take a step back, the overall idea behind this bill is that um, Currently, officers can in Vermont and, and in many states in the country um, can uh, can receive a um, a warrant that does not require any notice, any indication um, that law enforcement is entering a space. Um, this we've seen the use of two no knock warrant bans in Vermont in recent years. Um, one that resulted in in the death of someone. Um, one that involves some stray bullets into neighbors' homes. Um, it's, it's determined that about 10 deaths each year of completely innocent people occur um, because of no-knock warrants. Um, most recently, people may have read about the sad, unfortunate um, murder of Amir Locke in Minneapolis, um, who, they, who it's believed uh, between the police um, entering the home without any indication and killing Amir Locke was about nine seconds um, with not a lot of words exchanged with him. Um, this follows on the heels of the devastating murder of Breonna Taylor as well in Kentucky. Um, and so this bill um, does have an exemption for uh, a situation where the officer believes that um, their life or the life of someone inside would be endangered um, if they were to knock on the door. Um, other states have a number of additional exemptions. I think those create a lot of loopholes to make the, the ban essentially ineffective. Um, but, you know, I also maintain, as I've come to this committee to testify, that the notion that an officer believes their life or the life of someone else is in danger if they knock um, should still be predicated on a really strong um, registry of disclosure around any misclassification of information or mischaracterization of information in an officer's past. So I think their you know, honesty and credibility is certainly in question here. And this ties back to something we're working on in Senate government operations, in my mind, around officer accountability and credibility. Uh, but regardless, I felt this exemption made sense um, for law enforcement to be able to execute their duties um, safely and uh, without loss of life. Um, and I believe with that exemption, this may have the support of the attorney general's office. That was an original indication. They were looking at Nevada, which has about five exemptions. Um, and so you have to get their perspective. Uh, but, you know, this is an issue that continues to come up around the country. Truly, I think Vermonters believe we are, you know, we, our home is our domain. Um, we have lots of people who have shot at folks who've come into their house unannounced. Um, I believe a no-knock warrant ban in a state like Vermont that prides itself on people being the sort of king of their castle, um, you know, can only create more loss of life and more dangerous situations um, than ensuring that proper procedures are followed and, and people are announced before entering someone else's home. Senator Baruth first, and then I think Senator Benning had a question. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I appreciate the, the introduction of the, the bill and the start of the conversation. Um, I did want to ask you about that exception because, you know, with the use of force bill, for instance, we talked a lot about an officer's perception of, uh, of threat to themselves. And speaking only for myself personally, it, it has seemed to me over the years that that has become 
a one size fits all, uh, you know, personal exemption from most sorts of responsibility for a police officer. Inevitably, when when someone is killed um, through, uh, you know, use of lethal force, the officer and the police union immediately say that the officer was in fear for his or her life. So I'm curious, with the, with the no-knock warrant, it seems as though the, the reason that would be stated for the no-knock warrant is that it decreases the danger uh, not to give notice. Um, so uh, this, you, you, you um, correctly say that it's one exemption, but it, couldn't it be just a, a blanket exemption that every case would uh, bring up? I mean, I, you know, I would leave that to the committee to look at what other states have done and determine if there's a way for the officer to have to demonstrate that they truly need a no-knock warrant ban because of, um, you know, the real threat of danger who, based on who the particular person is uh, named in the warrant. Um, you know, the, I was sympathetic to the idea that someone also inside might be in danger in a domestic violence situation, um, but... I completely hear you, Senator Bruce. I have trouble with any loopholes that are based solely on officer discretion and their disclosure of their, it, it, you know, perception of the situation. It's why I referenced um, the the Giglio Registry and the Brady file disclosure uh, pieces that we're working on in Senate Government Operations. As I've discussed in this committee before, an officer's word and credibility is really, really critical to public safety. And um, you know, they there should be a very high standard maintained of not promoting an officer or allowing them to take the witness stand if they have demonstrated a lack of credibility and a mischaracterization of information in the past. But um, that should be the. As I read this exemption, mm -hmm. it's the court that makes the determination, not the officer. And maybe I'm missing something here, but. The, the wording is that the affidavit submitted by the law enforcement officer with the warrant application demonstrates to the satisfaction of the court that identifying the presence of the, of the officer before entering the premises is likely to create an imminent threat of serious bodily harm to the officer or another person. So it's not the officer that um, says when they enter the premises that, you know, that they want it do no knock it's the court has to be satisfied. Right, and I think for the court to be satisfied, they should know that they're talking to an officer who has a history of not seeking that every time um, they go to execute a warrant, but have, have a history of honesty and accountability in the information they present. Um, so yes, agreed, it, you know, it is something that's up to the court to determine, not the individual officer. And I would hope the court would take into account serious and significant information about a past record or the history of violence of that person who the warrant would be executed against. Um, but yes, it does not, um, it sh I should have emphasized in case it wasn't clear, it doesn't allow the officer to make the determination at the door of the person. They would have to be receiving a no-knock warrant ban um, that the court weighed was, uh, was somebody who could cause danger to someone inside. But you know, an officer who continues to ask for that kind of no-knock warrant, um, I think hopefully would merit some attention from the court and from the department. And I, I just to uh, close off my, my inquiry, I, I see that. Um, I guess I still worry that there is, in the system itself, of its many parts, so among law enforcement, among courts, among juries, I think there has grown up the idea that if an office, if an officer says that they are in fear for their life, or in this case comes forward with a request for a no-knock warrant, that we should defer to that request because they are indicating that they're in fear. Um, mm -hmm. And if if we're going to reform the system, it seems we have to push back on all of those levels. Um, but I, I I just bring it up as a way of saying that. As we go forward, I think that's something for us to keep an eye on is, um, I appreciate that there's only one exemption, but um, maybe that one can be um, kept tight. Absolutely, agreed, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Anything else for Senator Ron Hensdale? Thank you so much for taking time away from your other committee. 
thank you for, for taking up this issue and, and giving it a fair hearing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Eric, do you want to walk us through the bill? Sure, sounds good. Um, good morning again, everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Council. Here now to walk the committee through uh, S-228, which is an act relating to prohibiting no-knock warrants. Uh, uh, you just heard a, a pretty good walkthrough of the bill already from Senator Ron Hisdale, and I'll be happy to uh, add some background to that as well and some details that might be useful for the committee as you think about the language. Uh, first of all, as, as Senator Ron Hinsdale mentioned, there are other states that have this prohibition in statute. In particular, S-228, uh, I was able to look at some of the language in the Virginia statute and the Nevada statute, both of which were passed within the last year, so they're pretty recent. And I also used the Oregon statute. So those were the three that I was looking at and uh, sort of taking concepts and language from those three. The Oregon one has been on the books for, for much longer, but the, the Virginia and Nevada ones are, are quite recent. And there's also uh, a constitutional basis for this. So that, in other words, the, the idea of knock and announce, in other words, and that's a, pr a constitutional principle under the Fourth Amendment that law enforcement officers are generally required to knock and announce their presence, sorry, their presence <laughs> when, uh, when serving a warrant. Uh, that also was been around for some time. There was a United States Supreme Court case on that called um, uh, Wilson v. Arkansas from 1995, which uh, was where that principle really first got announced, but, but um, it has a number of exceptions. The constitutional principle does, and it has a, another big difference with relation to the exclusionary rule, which I will mention as I go through the bill. So, so the bill is broader and offers a, a, a broader basis uh, of prohibition on the use of no-knock no warrants than the constitutional principle does. So, but it's important to know that it's out there and that there is a constitutional basis for this in, in the Fourth Amendment. So, uh, having said that, the, uh, the perhaps most straightforward part of the bill is the fact that it is just a straightforward prohibition. It's a prohibition on the use of no-knock warrants, uh, with the one exception that Senator Ron Hinsdale was mentioning. But obviously important to that is, uh, well, what is a no-knock warrant? And that's the, the defined term in the bill, also using pretty well-known language definition, actually is very similar to the definition in the Nevada statute. It means a search warrant authorizing a law enforcement officer to enter a premises without knocking and announcing the officer's presence and purpose prior to entering the, per the premises. So again, that's that knock and announce principle that I was just talking about, which has that constitutional basis. But yeah, so a no-knock warrant means one in which they don't knock and announce. The, the officer doesn't knock and indicate um, uh, what, the per what the officer's purpose is for being there and announcing the officer's presence. So generally speaking, those types of warrants no knock warrants are prohibited by the bill. Uh, the the uh, exception, the language of the exception is actually that the committee has been discussing that a little bit this morning. And that's the, the situation in which uh, the officer is able to demonstrate to the, to the court, to the judicial officer that's issuing the warrant, uh, that announcing their presence would be likely to create an imminent threat of serious bodily harm to the officer or another person. So as you mentioned, Senator Sears, that's a finding that the court has to make when the application for the warrant is made. And Eric, the, that language is also based on the Nevada statute, which also requires that the court make the finding. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, um, if I might. Um, I'm just wondering if, and it may be that we want to wait for the witnesses, but can you tell me if now, prior to this bill, it seems to me that if you're that if you're looking for a no-knock warrant now, you would have to do a version of this, wouldn't you? Where you'd, you'd have to say to the judge, we, we need to go in for this reason. How, how does this differ from what is currently done? That's an interesting question. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm gonna uh, probably not wade into it because I'm not sure the answer. I think you're right. The practitioners okay. would have a better answer for you on how that happens in practice. Uh, I do know that the, that is similar to one of the exceptions that exists in the, uh, I pulled up the, the, I mentioned that there's a constitutional basis for this. And uh, um, one of the uh, exceptions in the constitutional principle is similar and that it says, when law enforcement officers reasonably fear violence uh, if they provide notice before entry. So that's mm -hmm. uh, similar to that, but it doesn't really answer your question about 
process? You know, how, how, how is, is that something that's sort of articulated in retrospect, or is it something that has to be demonstrated in the first instance to the court right. that issues the warrant? Because the, the, the question I would have is this um, seeks to prohibit the use of these warrants, but it says you can use them if you feel as though they would protect against some additional danger. But it seems to me under the current system, that's what we have. So in other words, under the current system, it seems we have a prohibition on them unless you can say that you need one. And a court says, yes, you do. So I, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe now they don't need the judicial discretion for the, the no-knock part of it, but I would imagine they do. So uh, I'll be interested to hear what uh, John Campbell and Matt Valerio and uh, Mike Sherling have to say about that, as, as well as uh, state police. Right. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the, the second two pieces of the bill, uh, you'll see that in addition to the prohibition on no-knock warrants in subdivision A2, there's, a, there's an independent requirement, obviously related and connected, that specifically you know, expressly provides that prior to entering the premises to execute a warrant, a law enforcement officer shall provide audible or otherwise appropriate notice of the officer's identity and purpose to the occupant of the premises. So it's a similar concept. It's uh, expressly articulating uh, that the knock and announce uh, requirement is an affirmative obligation for the officer when they arrive to execute the warrant. And lastly, and this is a key difference, uh, sorry, let's go ahead. In that process though, that gives the, the person who's has the warrant to search, the um, person who's being searched or being looked at opportunity to flee, opportunity to flush. You know, we always see the heroin going down the toilet or whatever, but an opportunity to get rid of the uh, the evidence. So is that is that part of the this process in two? That's that not addressed the in the process? bill, but, I, but it's not addressed in the bill, but I think you're, that is uh, a concern that is obviously always around uh, this situation. In fact, one of the other exceptions in the federal constitutional principle is that so that the when officers have reason to believe that evidence may be destroyed if they were to provide notice before entry. So that's one of the exceptions well, in, that, the, in the constitutional that's, that, situation. That's much more artfully stated than I stated it, but that's exactly. <laughs> well, I didn't, that's I'm just reading it. <laughs> well, I didn't write it either. <laughs> well, thank you. Senator yeah. White. So the way I understood it is that it's, and we'll hear from others, but it's already hard to get a, a no-knock warrant in Vermont. I don't know about it anyplace else. And if you can justify to the judiciary getting a no-knock warrant, then why would you um, announce yourself when you get there? Because the point of a no-knock warrant is, and it shouldn't be used very often, but the point is because the person inside will jump out the back window or as Senator Sir, I, so I, I'm, I'm really confused here. So well, can, that, that's, can, yeah, Senator Baruf. Yeah. Just wondering if I can uh, maybe, I, I have a, the same question as Senator White. Is, is section two saying that in the event that you aren't allowed a no-knock warrant, then it's restating that you must announce your presence or is it, um, is it in conflict with the first section? I believe I, I, my read was the former Senator Brew. Okay. In, yeah. So, so that it's perhaps should be better articulated. So it's um, so again, and and I might be just reading this a little too closely, but it it seems like what this is doing is art is rearticulating in stronger terms what already exists, and otherwise. Right now, there's a ban on no-knock warrants for constitutional reasons, unless you can convince a judge that you need one because you're in danger. And then you have to announce your presence unless you got one. So I'm, I'm not clear yet on what this bill does that changes the current system. Well, I'm a, I'm a, that's a nice segue, but I'm going to respond to one thing that you just said, but it's also 
Subsection okay. B is a significant change from the from the current system. But prior to that, I yes. should also mention that uh, um, this constitutional principle is is articulated as uh, when one determines when the court determines whether whether uh, a no knock warrant was appropriate in a given situation or whether a a search and seizure was appropriate, it considers the totality of the circumstances. And it's the courts often say that, for example, the fact that the knock and announce rule, which is the constitutional principle, wasn't complied with, is a circumstance that that would be considered when determining whether whether the uh, whether the search was reasonable. But it it does not appear to operate in, as a complete sort of prohibition in the same way that the language of the bill does. The language clearly says you can't use them unless it meets this one exception. The federal principle says it's a totality of the circumstances analysis, and there's a longer list of exceptions. So uh, um, for those two reasons, I think this is distinct and uh, affords a, a more broad prohibition on the use of no knock warrants than the constitutional provision does. Uh, in addition to that, subsection B is very important, and that's the exclusionary rule. You see, with the, you've, we've dealt with the exclusionary rule in this committee many times in the past. And what that means is that in certain circumstances, uh, when evidence is obtained through unconstitutional means, the court will exclude the evidence from being able to be used during the criminal court proceeding. That's why it's known as the exclusionary rule. However, under the federal knock and announce rule that we've been talking about that's under the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the courts have quite consistently said the exclusionary rule does not apply. So if the, if the knock and announce rule is violated, evidence that is obtained during the search can still be used. Subsection B, you'll see, takes the opposite approach. This, and that's based on uh, the Virginia statute, also had an exclusionary rule in statute. And this says, information or evidence obtained in violation of subsection A. So in other words, if it was a, 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 knock, uh, uh, a no knock warrant was used, without mm -hmm. complying with the requirements of subsection A and evidence was obtained, then it can't be used in the criminal proceeding. So that's a procedural distinction between the, the two approaches. Mm -hmm. Senator Benning, then Senator so, from White. <clears throat> so Eric, I'm reading line 19. If the police violate subsection A in retrieving some evidence and in the subsequent divorce proceeding, a wife of someone who was the target of that police um, invasion, if you will, the wife cannot use that evidence in a civil proceeding. The word any court proceeding is just causing me some hiccup here. Right. And I understand the, uh, suppression in a criminal case, but I'm, I'm questioning whether you want to go as far as saying any court proceeding. Yes, that's a that's a good point, Senator Benning. And uh, that's a, a policy choice for the committee. And in, in the existing Vermont law on the prohibition on law enforcement use of drones, uh, that's where I took the any court proceeding from. However, uh, I was just mentioning the Virginia statute and that uh, exclusionary rule applies only, can't be admitted into evidence in any prosecution. So a policy choice for you guys, but yeah, you might want to, if you feel that it, it uh, there might be other unrelated court proceedings where that evidence should be able to be admitted, you could narrow it down that way, absolutely. Well, if the glove fits, <laughs> it's the one that comes to mind. <laughs> Right. Well, I was, I was thinking that, you know, if they raided a house where the husband, for instance, was suspected of child pornography and they obtained that evidence in violation of this rule and the wife is now in a court proceeding, if I'm reading this language correctly, she could not use that in a divorce case. And I don't want to go that far. I understand that. preventing it from the criminal prosecution. That makes perfect sense. But I'm, yeah. I'm questioning any. I think, yeah, I. That's a good point, Senator um, Senator White. So this may not be a question for Eric, but maybe for the people who are testifying later. But I, and I know Senator Ram Hinsdale said at the beginning, but I can't remember it right now, how many 
<coughs> no knock warrants have been used in Vermont, say in the last 10 years. And what were the, and I don't know if we can hear what the circumstances of those were, if they were warranted, that's a bad word to use right now, but if they were, why, why they were issued. If they were um, valid. Yeah, valid, valid, thank you. <laughs> it's better than warranted to hear. But, so I guess that really isn't a question for you, is it, Eric? No, I don't have that information, but, but okay. if the witnesses aren't able to have it, it might be, maybe it's something we could ask the court, maybe they would have a record of that sort of thing, but. Um, okay. Good Thanks. question. That, yeah. That's all we, I'm. We could, if we decide to go further with this, we could certainly have Judge Zonay okay. come in and ask him questions like that. I, I do want to mention just one thing that um, I don't know, it's not in this bill, but um, Senator Rom Hinsdale mentioned the Brianna Taylor, and that was a case where the police went to the wrong uh, apartment. Right. Um, that doesn't change this. If, if you have a no-knock warrant and you go to the wrong place, <laughs> that how does that fit in here? It doesn't fit in, does it? I don't think so. No, I think that if the warrant was properly issued, um, then I don't think it's covered by this language. That may be something to consider too, and, and regret. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, why don't we uh, go to directly to Commissioner? Sher uh, yeah, Commissioner Shirley. I'm sorry. I was going to make you secretary. Yes. That was a prior prior life. <laughs> um, Senator White's committee's debating that, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> why not? I might not be around to see it, but uh, but perhaps. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me in, um, um, Mike Charling, uh, Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, I was planning to just uh, speak for two or three minutes broadly, but it, it strikes me as the initial conversations happening that it may make sense to to walk you through how. Uh, what, what the process for warrants is briefly. So take a, another three or four minutes to, to do that. Um, the, the general uh, overlay on search and seizure, uh, which is governed primarily by uh, the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, Article 11 of the Vermont Constitution, is that you need a warrant in order to search for something, whether that is a person or um, evidence or fruits of a crime and the underpinnings there are that uh, a, a law enforcement officer may make application, uh, usually in Vermont done through a state's attorney, so there's a level of review that happens prior to getting to the court, where they must articulate uh, probable cause, uh, uh, proof, uh, facts and circumstances that would lead a reasonable and prudent person to believe the facts are, are accurate, that um, there is uh, evidence of a crime or a person um, and that those things will be found in the place to be searched. So you have to make the nexus to a crime and then you have to make a nexus to indicate that you've got probable cause to believe that the place you wanna search, whether that is a house, a car, or any other container, briefcase, a wallet, a, a piece of digital media, um, that, the, that there's evidence that, uh, of that crime that'll be found in that particular place. Um, as Eric indicated, there's an extra layer uh, of information that's required in order to apply uh, to a judge to get a warrant that does not require uh, what is typical, which is that you knock, constitutionally, you, you knock and announce the presence of law enforcement and that you have a warrant, and then you go in to execute that warrant. Typically, you're waiting for someone to answer the door, but uh, after a reasonable amount of time, you may make a forced entry, uh, again, depending on the, the circumstances. Um, no knock warrants are incredibly rare uh, in Vermont. Um, I should also just take the quick side road to again remind the committee that policing in Vermont bears little, if any, resemblance uh, to what happens in places like Minnesota or Kentucky. Um, 
they're rarely executed um, with no knock, uh, and they're tip when they do occur. Uh, and I can only remember a handful um, uh, occurring in Burlington during 26 or so years there. Um, it is uh, under extremely unusual circumstances where there is a an articulable danger on the other side of that door, and there isn't another. Um, mechanism where we can script to get access to that person or that residence um, in, in a way that will mitigate that danger. So there's sort of two things that get assessed. Is there another way to do this? Is there a way to wait out going in without a no-knock? Because there's an inherent danger, to, not only to the folks on the other side of the door, but to the officers going through that door as well. Um, uh, so if there's not an, uh, an alternative, is uh, is there another way to script it in a way that creates safety? And the, the no-knock really is a, a last resort. Important to note, however, that from time to time, again, rare, but um, it does happen uh, a few times a year where you'll go to a door and you'll have, uh, in some cases, you have a warrant to go in and search for a person or for evidence. In other cases, you may be there to conduct an interview and the circumstances immediately present exigency, which means it's immediately apparent to the officer that you've got to go in and do something in order to prevent harm to another person. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples from, uh, again, I, I don't have a tremendous number of them because they don't happen with great frequency, but a couple um, that, that I'm familiar with. Um, I was at the uh, the back responding to a, a call in this case, no warrant, um, back door to a three story residence, uh, report of a domestic disturbance, not an assault going on. Um, before we even got to the door, we could hear a woman screaming for her life on the other side of that door. Now, keep in mind, we do not have a warrant, but the uh, warrantless exception to enter that residence under exigent circumstances immediately applies. That door was kicked in and she was rescued from an ongoing assault and suspect actually fled to the third floor um, roof of the complex where he barricaded himself until we were able to successfully get him uh, off uh, the roof. Um, another example, one in which uh, in a sex crimes unit, there was a warrant. Um, detectives went to the door immediately. Heard, this was not a no-knock warrant. Immediately heard a shot fired. Um, we're not in a position to retreat, so the immediate um, uh, uh, decision was made to mitigate any ongoing threat by going through the door without knocking and announcing, um, and in that particular case found the suspect um, had in, uh, inflicted a fatal self-inflicted gunshot wound, but that wasn't, of course, known at the time that shot was fired. So... Uh, I give you all of that background um, to bring you to this point. Um, uh, Captain Dave Peterson is going to walk you through uh, the frequency and some additional detail around how no-knock warrants and warrants in general are, are executed. Um, but the, I, I guess our, our, we're prepared to get into a far more nuanced detail uh, around the bill if the committee sees fit to, to pursue this. Um, Generally, we agree that no-knock warrants should be restricted. They are heavily restricted and, and uh, very rarely used in Vermont now. Um, leave to your discretion whether it makes sense to memorialize that uh, in, in statute. Um, but we're, I, you know, I think we're in a, our primary um, point is that it's, it's a little more complicated than, uh, um, than just saying, hey, these things are dangerous and we should put restrictions on them. It's very difficult to script all the possible iterations of what you might see when you get to a door with or without uh, a search warrant and the types of exigency, danger, um, barricaded subjects, loss of evidence, et cetera, that, that could happen. Uh, I'm not familiar with any no-knock scenarios where um, it has been for evidence loss exclusively um, although I, I know that occasionally happens uh, in federal cases. Uh, and the other example is uh, I would uh, just leave you with before we turn it over to uh, at your discretion to, to Captain Peterson to fill in more detail is uh, occasionally we are looking for uh, suspects who 
um, have a long history of violence and are clearly uh, um, uh, pose a risk if we were to knock and announce with a warrant to, to go in and get them. Um, probably the most uh, top of mind regional example of that would be, uh, a again, a hypothetical example that if the Danamora suspects who are on the run, uh, if a warrant was needed to go in and get one of them, that that would have been an application for a no-knock uh, warrant under those circumstances. And from time to time, we run into those uh, here in Vermont mm -hmm. as well. But I will um, reiterate to the committee that the preference in terms of scripting how those operations unfold is to find a way uh, to get to those kinds of dangerous suspects without having to go through a door where you don't know what's on the other side or that person has the opportunity to arm themselves uh, or take some kind of a stand. So uh, even for uh, the law enforcement operations, the no knock or the, the go through the door under exigent circumstances is not the preferred way to do it. It's just unfortunately the way sometimes we find ourselves uh, stuck with that scenario because we can't control all the circumstances under which we encounter violent individuals. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Senator Baruth. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Sherling. I'm just wondering when you look at the bill, um, and I'm thinking here about specifically um, the 8122A1 and A2, to what extent does that seem to you to map the way we currently do it? And to what extent does it deviate from the way we currently do it? Generally, it appears more restrictive and some of the language is, um, is I, I can't exactly tell you where it's pulled from, but using words like imminently, for example, it'd be difficult for a court to assess whether, um, you know, absent being at the door with the officer, whether something would be imminent or not. Uh, you know, the existing, framework is you have to be able to reasonably articulate um, probable cause that uh, absent knocking, there will be a, uh, an, an increased threat of, um, of uh, injury or, uh, or serious jeopardy of the people going through the door. The example there would be, you have a suspect who says things like, I won't be taken alive. Um, this is gonna be the last stand at the OK Corral. You know, people say those kinds of things. <laughs> occasionally, uh, and some of them mean them. Um, so long story short, I, I, I think uh, if the committee were to want to pursue it, we would, um, we would offer some uh, modified language to try to get to the, the right balance of, uh, of safety and, and, uh, and restriction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think Dick may have frozen. So I, I think uh, Officer Peterson, uh, you're next on the witness list. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to come and speak on this topic. Just uh, to introduce myself briefly for those that may not be aware. Um, I've been with the Vermont State Police for over 20 years now. Currently I serve as the Special Operations Commander uh, in that role, I uh, oversee uh, our specialized units, um, the traffic safety mission, as well as involved in planning and overseeing special events throughout the state of Vermont. Uh, in my career, I've had the opportunity to serve um, across all three divisions within the state police. And uh, my previous assignment was as a professional standards commander for the state police, which had an integral role in policy development within the organization. So that's a little bit of my background. I just wanna hit on a couple of points related to this. Um, overwhelmingly, the Vermont State Police's practice when executing warrants is in a knock and announce fashion. Uh, as Commissioner Sherling mentioned, uh, there is a heightened danger when it comes to execution of a no knock warrant. Um, Quite frankly, any search warrant execution bears some level of danger. Um, commonly, for instance, uh, 
Uh, we see firearms present at a residence as, as often as we don't. So um, there are some baseline dangers that come with making any type of uh, enforcement entry into a residence. Making that entry in a no-knock fashion only heightens that potential danger um, by not giving notification to the occupants of who's coming into their house. Uh, the, the commissioner talked about uh, our practices when it comes to ex, um, applying for and the judicial review of no-knock warrant applications. Uh, for, the, for the Vermont State Police, we rely on articulable case facts uh, which get listed in our affidavit supporting the search warrant application uh, to justify uh, to a judicial review, not only at this stage, not only judicial review, but also to the prosecutor's office, um, a no-knock request. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, we call on our members to um, continue to assess the circumstances surrounding the investigation to determine even after a no-knock warrant would be issued by judicial review to assess if the execution of the warrant in that fashion is justified. Is the is it prudent for us to for the investigative interest to continue to operate at that heightened risk level um, for the value that would be obtained through executing the warrant in that style. So I did a little bit of limited research um, through some of our digital files to see what I could find uh, related to numbers of um, warrants um, in a no-knock fashion. So my research dated back to the beginning of 2017 and goes through the end of 2021. Uh, in that time, I was able to identify um, two or three instances where the Vermont State Police had obtained a judicially authorized no-knock warrant and actually executed the warrant in that fashion, meaning a, a non-announcement prior to making entry into the premises. Uh, I was able to also identify two instances where the Vermont State Police supported other agencies that had applied for and been granted a warrant with a no-knock exception. Um, and I was further able to identify instances where a no-knock warrant was authorized. However, the warrant was ultimately executed in a knock and announce fashion. Um, obviously, this is um, uh, this research was done in a, in a short setting. I can't say that it's comprehensive, but hopefully it provides some sort of um, quantitative um, information as to the commonality of this in the state of Vermont. Oh, it's very, very useful. Um, could you just say another word about the uh, other agencies who sought and obtained knock, no knock warrants? Would that be somebody like DCF or? Those would be other law enforcement agencies. Oh. So municipal agencies or sheriff departments or something like that. I see, okay. Senator White. So I wonder um, if you, thank you for the information. I wonder if you have any ability to tell us some of the circumstances around those two or three that were actually executed. If they're, um, I'm trying to wrap my head around when when it would seem necessary because that's maybe three and five years by the state police and maybe another two or three in that period of time by other agencies. So it isn't very many, but could you give us some idea of the circumstances? Yeah, just to be clear, Senator White, uh, what I'm able to provide is apparent VSP involvement in these types of execution. It is in theory possible that other agencies are obtaining these and executing them without, without the involvement of the state police. But yeah. uh, I would say that there's a fair amount of resource sharing that takes place across the law enforcement community in the state of Vermont. So uh, I, I do think this is somewhat informative at least. Um, in regards to your question about the actual instances of those two or three um, I'd have to do a little bit more digging. I can certainly prov probably provide some um, 
information about what prompted the request to go through um, and what information was presented in this type of investigation, if that would be helpful. No, but they, they it probably doesn't, um, again, I was gonna say warrant, but um, justify um, additional research, but I, but they were granted by the, the court did see that there was enough um, reason there to grant them. That's correct. Senator. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, other questions for Captain Peterson. Thank you, Captain. We we appreciate it. Um, we'll move to John Campbell for the state's attorneys. John, are you with us? Yes, I am. Um, a little bit under the weather, but I'm here. So that's why I got my my old DJ voice back, I guess. Senator Sears is, uh, I, I think, has internet issues. So, oh. He's coming in on his iPad, so. There, there he is. Okay. So. Feel, um, feel free, John. Okay, uh, John Campbell, Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs uh, here uh, to testify. Um, actually, I'm here because Evan Maiden, who would have been here, is over in uh, the House uh, testifying on another bill there. Um, so I'm sort of filling in. But um, let, me, let me just start by saying, I think that really, and this has been said already, already is that the uh, uh, we get, go ahead john i i think dick uh just had two two uh devices two things, running. Right. you're yeah. correct and i don't yeah. know how long it'll last evidently every time the wind blows my internet goes out that's well i thought that governor shumlin said that we have perfect internet all throughout <laughs> the entire state I'm, I'm mission sure accomplished that. <laughs> anyway, um, as, as was, has been said, one of the things that really to know is that these are extremely frequent, uh, infrequent. And in fact, I had uh, asked our state's attorneys and, um, you know, we have a lot of newer state attorneys, but um, there's not, I, I still have not found one that they have heard that maybe one or two had been used, but um, not that the ones at least that have gotten back to me that they did not authorize or ask uh, or, or sign on with a uh, law enforcement agency that was asking for uh, a no-knock type of warrant. Um, and, and it's also clear too that the, the, these are not, um, these can be uh, dangerous situations uh, when, when uh, that is used. Um, but I, I think it was interesting what, what uh, Commissioner Shirley said is that Vermont police uh, situations and what happens here is very different than what happens around the country. And th that is absolutely true. Um, I think we have a very uh, progressive um, law enforcement community and, and um, the, the only time that, that you'll see, I, I believe that uh, these occurring is when there are those exited, exited uh, circumstances. Um, so in reviewing the bill, you know, the, the concern that I have right, right off, again, I, I understand that the, the purpose um, is the, the language that we're trying to bring in here, I think it is confusing. Um, I, I think that there's, that this is certainly one that would be litigated. Um, I, I think that uh, Senator Benning pointed out a very good point uh, is that if you're, if the uh, evidence is gonna be suppressed um, or excluded from any type of uh, court proceeding, uh, this would eliminate uh, the the evidence being used in any court, not just um, in the criminal court or, the, or this criminal prosecution. The the one thing that um, uh, was uh, discussed in, in my office was that uh, the biggest concern that they often have, besides the first one, is of course of imminent uh, bodily injury to to uh, a person. If there's if there's a chance of somebody being hurt, um, then you know you want to be able to get in there. Uh, and, and save that person. But the destruction of evidence is also important, um, especially in the child pornography cases. Uh, Evan, who actually used to prosecute those, um, had uh, he said that you know, it's frequent that you, know, you have um, one of these people who are very sophisticated when it comes to child porn, they have the ability with uh, just a couple of hits of the, of the computer switches or computer uh, buttons to uh, destroy the evidence, um, and of course, these this is um, these cases are are, are very um, difficult to begin with. And if you lose the evidence, it's it's going to be cause a um, you know, it's going to be very problematic, obviously. And 
there are children, the children are the victims here. So there's a concern that, um, that this may not, um, uh, this may extend to causing problems with uh, trying to prevent people from destruction of evidence. Uh, I, I, again, I, I think if, if the committee is gonna go forward, what I'd like to do if, is to have a couple of the state's attorneys who actually have uh, participated in that to come in and, and testify and, and let you know, uh, give you more specifics. I think it would be problematic. Um, and I, I think the, maybe the captain just mentioned this as far as that I'm looking at the statute over here, um, is that uh, for the court to make the determination of like that, whether there's uh, the imminent threat, that, that's gonna be pretty tough, uh, a call to be made back in the, in the courtroom or in his, his chambers or her chambers. Uh, because a lot of times, uh, most times you're not gonna know uh, until you get to the scene or unless you have had uh, you know, some, some knowledge uh, about the person like this uh, with, that, that had weapons. Uh, and those would be articulated anyway um, in the uh, initial warrant. But as far as um, if you take everything away from the police officer on the scene, then I think that might be causing, that would cause uh, some serious, uh, serious issues. But um, so overall, I, I think that there's, um, that there's an understanding of why this would, you'd want to prevent uh, people from just, you know, busting in people's houses, but that's what the Fourth Amendment's all about, is that there's, you know, no one can, should be subject to um, unreasonable search and seizure and, you know, and warrantless. Uh, in, in these situations where they're getting the warrant, they're presenting the information to the courts, and you would like to be able to prevent any uh, possibility of, of an injury to, um, uh, to a, anybody, but especially to somebody who might find themselves in a place that, uh, that uh, innocently in, the, in a location where they do execute one of these warrants. So, um, but I think you can work through that uh, to get the language um, that would, would protect the exceptions we needed and yet uh, still uh, deal with uh, the issue, the underlying issue. Um, one, one other quick one is that the, uh, one of the uh, terms here is that uh, I believe they put that um, our existing exception is for bodily harm, uh, imminent body, bodily harm. And I believe here in this, it puts it as um, serious bodily injury, which is defined differently. And uh, so it would not take into consideration, I, I don't think uh, certain cases, especially in a domestic violence situations where the harm may not be rise to the level of um, serious uh, bodily injury, which would be death or uh, major disfigurement, and, but it still be a bodily harm uh, that would uh, be something you'd want to prevent. So it's little things like that, that that I think have to be worked through if you're going to go forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Senator Bruce, I prefer that you continue on because I may lose internet at any time. Okay, sure. Uh, any questions for John Campbell? All right. Thanks, John. Uh, Matt Valerio, Defender General. Uh, welcome, Matt. Thank you for having me. Um, this is, uh, I'm always heartened when I can talk about a particular area of the law that I had a lot of experience with when I was in private practice. And uh, interestingly enough, I disagree with almost nothing that the prior witnesses have, have said about this subject. Um, I've been practicing law for about uh, 33, 34 years and um, in Vermont, um, I never, and I did a lot of drug uh, defense when I was in private practice and um, obviously oversee what goes on in uh, the appellate division of the Defender General's office. And I had never seen a no-knock warrant um, in all of those years in Vermont. Uh, this issue of no-knock warrants is a big issue nationally. Um, this is a huge concern. Um, and it, a lot of it uh, arises out of uh, 
prosecutions for drug offenses. Um, it, they tend, there's a, oftentimes a, uh, a, a racial bias and a targeting of uh, indigent folks and people of color in, uh, um, in other states. Uh, we just don't see these being used in Vermont as a practical matter. Um, and uh, I, I guess the only part that I would, and I, I wanna go through this a little bit, but uh, what I don't want you to do, and I think that uh, John Campbell was sort of conflating a, a bit of an issue here, is a difference between exigence and knock and announce when it comes to executing warrants and even getting warrants. Um, and I think the concerns that uh, John Campbell had uh, regarding this really have to do with the issue of exigency. Um, I don't see this bill as taking away an officer's right to respond to exigent circumstances um, at all. Um, this is more talking about what rights do the officers have to get um, a warrant in advance. Now we have to remember that um, Vermont's constitution um, in uh, Article 11 of Chapter 1 provides more protections regarding war the use of warrants um, to the public than Article than the uh, Fourth Amendment does under the U.S. Constitution, and as a result, most of the search and seizure law in Vermont, um, if not all of it, is developed under our um, our Vermont Constitution, Article 11, as opposed to Article 4 or uh, the Fourth Amendment. Um, and I'm suspecting that those protections that we have under Vermont, the Vermont Constitution are part of what prevent um, the, uh, the use of uh, no-knock warrants in Vermont. Also, it's just a culture uh, that we have in, uh, uh, you know, in Vermont that, that these tend not to be necessary. Um, so, you know, I don't see no-knock warrants in Vermont as being a particular problem, but I do understand those who um, support, uh, you know, eliminating no-knock warrants um, because of what they see nationally um, and the concerns that they they have, you know, with with some of the abuses that have taken place and the mistakes that have taken place, the loss of life, both for law enforcement and for uh, the general public. Um, you know, and, and so I understand where this is where this is coming from. In my review of the case law, you, you probably wouldn't be surprised that there's not a lot of case law in Vermont on no knock warrants because there aren't very many of them. Um, and usually, when there is, you know, one of the better cases that I came across was a case called State versus Ogden. Uh, it's a 1993 case um, in Vermont. Um, I still don't think that's a particularly old case, but uh, a lot of the lawyers who work for me would disagree. Um, and uh, that's at 161 Vermont 336, again, a 1993 case. And it deals with the issues of um, no-knock warrants. In, in the defendant in that case um, alleged on appeal that there was an effect, effectively a no-knock warrant because when the officers knocked, they didn't give him time to get to the door um, because he was sleeping. Um, and they came, after they knocked and announced, they came in and then um, they seized, a, there was a cultivation issue, I guess, involving pot. And that was, uh, that was what they were looking for. Uh, the thing that is good about this case is it sets forth the knock and announce uh, issues that, that you see. Um, uh, nationally, you see these cases where 
Um, uh, Rivera versus the United States in 1991 Second Circuit case. If you don't know, the Vermont is in the Second Circuit. Um, and it indicated on a federal level that failure to knock and announce was acceptable only where the officers had an objective, reasonable belief that there exists an imminent danger of bodily harm to persons inside or the destruction of critical evidence. But again, this is an exigency that would exclude the uh, exclude or excuse, I'm sorry, the compliance with a knock and announce requirement. Um, and under, uh, uh, so under Rivera, um, it talks about a knock and announce requirement. Part of the argument that was going on in State versus Ogden is whether or not there even was a knock and announce requirement under Vermont law. Um, and because they found that in that case, the police did knock and announce, even if the guy was asleep and didn't hear it, they never had to get to the issue of whether there even was a knock and announce requirement under Vermont law. Uh, but in looking at other case law, it did seem to suggest, of course, and this is something that's been you know, litigated all over the country where these things are very common, that um, exigency excludes the requirement to knock and announce. And usually it is because there is an imminent danger of uh, bodily harm to persons inside or destruction of critical evidence. Um, and that to me is effectively the standard that you would have to apply to get a no knock warrant in the first instance. You would have to be able to articulate a um, what these, uh, you know, that there would be bodily harm or destruction of criminal, criminal evidence. Um, the interesting thing about Vermont is it, it's governed by um, Rule 41 um, regarding application for warrants. So I, I want to go, I want to get back to the bill itself. Uh, I keep having things popping up on my screen here. Um, Sorry about that. There, there it is. Under 8122, the no knock warrants, unless the affidavit submitted by, uh, sorry, law enforcement shall uh, not seek, execute, or participate in the execution of a no knock warrant, unless the affidavit submitted by law enforcement demonstrates. And now I'm going to point out some problematic language from my point of view to the satisfaction of the court. Um, legally, I don't know what that means. Um, you know, usually it says by clear and convincing evidence or by a preponderance of the evidence. Um, the rule um, talks about by substantial evidence. Um, I think that that needs to be cleaned up. Um, because in law, to the satisfaction of the court, doesn't really mean anything. Um, it it would have to me if you if this was going to go forward, it would need to say something about what the standard of proof is. Uh, I would suggest that it uh, uh, it mirror what Rule Forty One says, which is by substantial evidence, um, or um, that you put in a uh, burden of proof that is um, consistent with something that lawyers understand, uh, you know, clear and convincing evidence, substant uh, um, preponderance of whatever the evidence, whatever it is, um, but set to the satisfaction of the court doesn't really cut it from a legal standpoint. Um, and then it goes on to say that uh, before entering the premise is likely to create an imminent threat of serious bodily harm um, to the officer or another person. Um, 
I didn't know who to another person was referring to. Um, these no-knock warrants, when they are executed, um, are dangerous to everybody. Uh, I know that law enforcement uh, doesn't like to uh, doesn't like to execute no-knock warrants because of the danger that they see to themselves. Um, they worry about also, though, the danger to third, you know, kind of innocent third parties who might be in the premises, um, not necessarily in the end, and I'm sure the targets even of the criminal investigation. Um, you know, there's a lot of liability that goes along with uh, no-doc warrants. And for the most part, these can be avoided by just doing not, you know, with your no normal knock and announce warrants. And then if you get to the premises and there's an exigence where you perceive somebody who is uh, in danger um, or you perceive that evidence is being destroyed as you're knocking on the door, um, then the, or you're going, getting ready to knock on the door, then you can go in and deal with it, deal with it that way. Um, I also picked up on the issue that uh, uh, Senator Benning did uh, regarding in any court proceeding under B. Um, I Generally, these no-knock warrants are justified um, to protect uh, law enforcement where there's a, a perceived threat. Um, and these are usually, uh, um, they, they tend to be in kind of higher stakes uh, um, drug cases um, or kidnapping situations uh, or that sort of thing. And that's reflected in Rule 41 of uh, the rules of uh, criminal procedure. Uh, the, uh, these are a little bit more common under federal law enforcement uh, situations, but of course, anything that we pass that here at the state level would not impact those cases. Um, I do think that by passing a bill that talks about uh, these no-knock warrants being disfavored, that it is an important symbolic statement uh, by Vermont that this isn't the type of uh, enforcement that we want to see in Vermont um, and that there are other ways to preserve evidence um, and the safety of bystanders um, without using no-doc warrants. Um, I would suggest that probably in Vermont, I, I, many people have are armed. Uh, they have hunting rifles, they have firearms and the like. Um, and at least, you know, it may not be as, as good for preserving evidence, but it, uh, um, it's probably safer for law enforcement and everybody else. Um, you know, if someone comes to my house or I'm suggesting perhaps other people's houses in, in the middle of the night or, and doesn't knock on the door and, and barges in, that probably increases their likelihood of being shot by a homeowner uh, more than knocking and announcing who, who's there. And uh, that's, I think, why we don't use them in Vermont. It is just a, it's a dangerous, dangerous situation. It is a tool that is available. Um, and, you know, on the whole, and, and this is, uh, I don't, I cannot disagree that it's a good statement to make that these are disfavored. Um, however, I do think that the um, case law that is out there um, regarding exigence as a an option to overcome um, a uh, knock requirement. Uh, is something that's pretty well understood. Um, and the standard that uh, a failure to knock and announce is only acceptable where officers have a reasonable belief objectively um, that there's imminent danger of bodily harm to persons inside or the destruction of crit critical evidence is something that, uh, um, you know, the system understands. Um, I, 
and I'm always leery of tinkering with something that the system understands and seems to be getting right. Um, I do think, however, that in recognition of the abuses that have gone on elsewhere, that is not a bad thing to um, put something forward that recognizes those problems, mm -hmm. um, e even if we aren't seeing them in Vermont. Thanks, Matt. I, I, uh, you anticipated my question with those last few lines. So it's your, it's your thinking that even though they're rare and even though the system works fairly well with them, that you would, um, you, or, or, not to put words in your mouth, you said you could see why we would put forward a bill um, that would speak to those abuses we've seen elsewhere. Yes. Okay. Other questions for Matt? It, it, Senator White? No, oh, I'm a little bit concerned, Matt, with your, with actually with your last statement, although, you know, Senator Baruch just asked you about that, but I, I have no interest actually in making statements because there are things happening in other places. And, and I'm concerned that if we did this, we would be, what we would be doing is tinkering with a system that, as you say, works, and how we would put language in here that would actually re exactly reflect what is currently happening and not upset that apple cart. Matt, you no, want to if you answer? if you have if you have language that would that would exactly do that because this language doesn't. So if you have language that would exactly do that. <clears throat> then I, I'd be listening to it. I think that I would leave that to the proponents of the bill. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to put, you know, I could draft all kinds of things, but it's, you know, the folks who are trying to get at the, the issue, I'll leave that to Senator Ram and, and, and others. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, other questions for Matt Valerio? Matt, thank you for joining us. I, I always appreciate your insights. Um, thank you. So uh, committee and um, remaining witnesses that are with us, uh, we're at the end of our witness list. I know that Senator Sears wants the committee to discuss this. Obviously, we can't do that without him present. Um, so um, uh, Unless there's a, a strenuous objection, I suggest that we adjourn the committee, go off YouTube. Um, and uh, Peggy, can you take us off YouTube?